Philip Washington Jr. is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and, unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. And now, here's Philip. All right, we are back with another episode of, really, this is my Wealth Building Made Simple Live on, that we stream on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, sort of different format than normal. But uh, I've been having these talks with smart people I know, brainstorming on different ideas. And so, got my guy, Stephen Ellis, here. Uh, go, go ahead and introduce, you know, yourself the way you want to be introduced, because you're a, you're a, a a guy of multiple talents so i don't want to put you in a box <laughs> on how you want to be introduced uh yeah so i'd say generally i'm a technologist uh, i'm a technologist that has an infinite curiosity about how new technology impacts like our world in different systems um and that has kind of been a passion of mine since i've been a kid so um whenever i do like either formal interviews or uh, talk to people. They're saying like, so when did you get into technology? And I was like, I've had a computer since I was three years old. So that was my formal introduction to it. And it has never stopped since. Um, <laughs> and so like, because of that, and like, I guess a little bit of like, I look at business as my art. So I like the way that businesses are constructed, the way that you use technology, the way that, that interacts with people, all of that is like brush strokes on a canvas to me. And so I've kind of taken that like creative spirit and moved through different industries and like applications following like how how does technology impact it? You know, where are the edges, where are the new opportunities being built with it? And then that has led to a career of leveraging that kind of like very, very broad and like contextual historical knowledge to apply to like how best ways of deploying technology strategically for certain effects inside of either enterprises or small businesses or brand new startups. Got it. And so, and I, and I want to touch a little bit on industries you've touched in the past, because that one of the most impressive things that, that when we met was, um, Hey, your, your breadth of knowledge. Cause, cause you know, you meet people with a breadth of, <clears throat> I don't know what the correct word is, a breadth of surface level understanding of what's going on, but not so much depth, right? And so in our conversation, we would talk about a topic that everybody talks about, and then you would we would be able to go deep, right? You a whole lot deeper than me. Um, and so I was like, man, this guy's super impressive. I definitely want to keep the conversation going. But let's let, let's talk about some of the things you've been involved with, right? From a applying your skills and talents and also applying applying money to it because right it's one thing to know about it but it's another thing to back it with your money yeah so uh, i guess i'll start like i would say the first formal industry that i was like bringing this together with is logistics so uh i've had three corporate jobs my entire life so i worked at ups right out of college um 7-eleven a couple years ago and most recently toyota and so at ups um it was the recession 2009 and i was like i need a job doing that job which is a very physical hands-on job like i started as a loader i realized that there was a data component to it and like having at that point you see i was like 21 so like i've built yeah, you know, been building computers my entire life i've been like playing around networking systems so i was like okay i see data everywhere how exactly is ups utilizing it and ups you know they utilize your standard logistics data so you have your excel um your you know schedules loads um uh, package amounts, that kind of stuff, like customer list clients, all of that comes together to give you like a picture of what's going on. And so I, as a loader, would utilize that to just understand my day. But then as I move through like part-time supervising and then doing like technology training and upgrades, I was utilizing or implementing those systems to get a tighter control as to like what was going on in any given like set of trucks or like the line or like understanding like which one of my loaders was going to be you know, heavily impacted for one day. Like, is there adjustments I can do to get specific speed and throughput? Um, that actually does have a full corollary to like the current work I'm doing in like the generative AI space, mm -hmm. because a lot of generative AI is moving into the direction of like general artificial intelligence. And like very simply for most, what most people understand about that is 
a computer that thinks like a human, right? But we as humans, for everything we've been able to do over the course of you know thousands of years of history, still have a light grasp on like exactly how complex our brains are. And like mm -hmm. the fact that it's not just like one thing that creates these kind of outputs. Like when someone paints a picture, multiple systems are going on for like fine muscle control. And then like the idea that they have in their head, they're conceptualizing, they're putting out through a brush stroke. There's, there's so many things going on. And when you build a machine to do something like this, you have to construct every single one of those systems and layer on top of them to get that output. And so taking my experience with like managing people and running people systems, extrapolating that into computer and physical systems saying, okay, if we, how do we do this best one-to-one? -one? And like one of the things as an avid fan of this podcast, you talk about emotion intelligence a lot. It is extremely hard to build a system that is performant and does things like humans without having the emotional intelligence to understand how humans would best perform. And so I'm experiencing this today. There's like this, this almost like an echo chamber loop of people thinking that you can take, they understand garbage in, garbage out from a data perspective, but they don't understand garbage in, garbage out from a management training perspective. If mm -hmm. you give bad, people bad information, you will get bad results. And for hundreds of thousands of years up to this point, we have been able to rely on human ingenuity to get over our bad instructions to get to a good result. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to put it. Because as you were going back on your on, on your history and getting started, I was like, oh, that makes sense that that, that you would start there because this definitely like, yeah, you know, and, and it, it it progressed from there. So it was like first UPS and logistics, and then specialty coffee and like coffee shops and the you know, bar management. Then that moves to like retail you know retail morphs into like e-commerce stuff then there was a blockchain and like a uh, big data component where we're like watching like market movements and like people that didn't have like a prescribed rule set just going in and trying some stuff you know like a bunch of the crypto stuff moving back and forth and so like all that combines to now everyone's like all right so how do we get computers to do all these things we kind of do badly better and it goes back to a very simple like design principle thinking of best instructions best results understand how to get the best instructions to then make the rest of that operation better because we mapped most of the process right it's just we haven't thought about now we're finding the input and output mm -hmm. yeah yeah no 100 percent. and so so and you hit on the point that i that i also appreciate it and like more and this will roll us into ai is i feel like in in business and technology and everything else in life you have like you know uh, ancient scripture calls it the mind of C Caesar. You know, I call it like nerd math, right? But basically I call it a, uh, an unbalanced approach to the way things work. And, and like you said, it, it's it's just the head without factoring in the heart. And when you yeah. just have the head without factoring in, in the heart, you're building like a tower of Babel, meaning like your stuff is going to crumble. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like you, you have to think about both. So as, as we think about like AI in the new world, helping us use data to aid us in building the new world that we live in, you know, what are some of the ways that the best ways you see um, to make money on that play? Right. Cause, and I give a little bit more context because, um, AI is different where if it feels to me sort of more like the internet and less like an Apple or a Bitcoin, right? Like, like Bitcoin and Apple were like scarce mm -hmm. um, resources that everybody gravitated to, but like everybody now can use AI. So you can't buy, right. you can't buy like an Apple, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the way I, I kind of, I structure it into like phases, right? And there's, this is not, I'm just, I'm not the originator of this idea. They have, you know, web 1.0, web 2.0, web 3.0. So when I think about web 1.0, web 1.0 was very much specifically communication at scale, right? It wasn't, I mean, it, it was new ways of doing it, but at the end of the day, like some of the most ubiquitous things that we rely on every day, email, um, you know, the, what is it? being able to create a web page, structure information, display the information reliably to hundreds of millions of people all over the place. Like that was web 1.0. It took 
our physical books, documents, signboards, storefronts, all it took all of these things that we did in the real world to interact with each other and kind of like, you know, telegraph to telephone, it shortened all of those connections. Web 2.0 was more about connecting the people. It's like, okay, now we can communicate really fast. We can create and destroy information super fast. But what does that mean to us? And so your social networks and your like um you know, organizational networks around businesses and like, you know, web e-commerce and like all that kind of stuff, that stuff turned into how do we understand in this new faster mode of communication, the interactions between each other and people made money figuring out how to communicate fast and communicate better. People made money figuring out how to understand construct and construct the connections between people. So the whole attention economy comes out of that. Web 3.0 is about how do we a do work faster and better and more repeatably because if you can do something repeatable and reliably, you can plan on it. And if you can plan on it, then you can start strategizing. But then the other part is how can you test things in le less expensive ways that before you couldn't test? So a good example of that is uh, like, let's just take ChatGPT. Everyone understands ChatGPT. You're going to ask a question and it's going to come up with an answer for a few different things, right? Whether or not it's right or wrong, that's not the point. The point is you can test responses to a question or to an idea. And you can test that at scale endlessly. If you would do the same thing, it would cost you 200 to 300,000, sorry, $200 to $300 an hour to talk to a consultant, a subject matter expert about that thing. And you could ask them as many questions as you had money to ask them questions. ChatGPT is your consultant. So right there, it's already like really, really shortened this arbitrage between specialized knowledge and you being able to ask questions in ways to get your own understanding and figure out if you're like on the right path or off the right path. So, you know, rolling forward inside of like how this is going to be utilized to like make money, we kind of don't know because to your point, it's the internet, but like the, the themes that I see emerging are um, productivity. So, hey, we think that our process currently works well today, but if we can map that process and then have the AI tested 50,000 times, we might find the one thing that makes it 10% better. But we wouldn't have known that until we ran 50,000 cycles, which could take people, manpower, time, company might die by that point. So you get to test things in like very controlled uh, tight spaces without needing to spend a bunch of money that you usually would have spent before. Um, so a good example of an industry that is that that basically shows this all the time. You can take Formula One racing, right? They have the, all the money in the world and some of the best technology in the world on cars. And they have thousands of people that run simulations to figure out how to get one tiny bit more performance out. And eventually that technology floats down to your Camry, right? But that takes years and cycles of racing for them to get those pieces and then figure out how to commercialize or find it and get back. Now you can have AI run those simulations at scale for all kinds of car models. And so you don't have to wait for it to go through the cycles of like racing to then performance cars, to expensive cars, you know, down to your e economic model to figure out that like, hey, if we move the spoiler slightly up by two inches, fuel economy goes up by 30 percent, like mm -hmm. like as a hypothetical example. Right. So if the AI is letting you do that there, it shortens all of those cycles. Now, some people say, well, that means that now all those jobs in between the Formula One guys and the, and the, the you know, Toyota car manufacturer go away and it doesn't because it spreads out horizontally. So now that same activity, you know, gets closer to, I would say, like the real economy, like the people, like Main Street spends all the money that builds Wall Street. So basically, if you can get that kind of testing and cycling and improvement down to that level, it then builds up the rest of the levels below it by actually pushing up and creating new foundations, as opposed to waiting for everything to kind of trickle down. And I will not get into the debate about trickle down versus, you know, <laughs> economics. They both work in different contexts. But um, I think we are seeing a place where, uh, similar to the, the internet, right? 1980s or so, we start getting personal computing. That you start seeing this big swell from the ground up of all these new industries and everything being created that pulled, you know, America out of a recession at that point, and also created brand new industries that never been that never existed before, and took old industries and expanded them massively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's it's funny it's funny you say that because I was um you you hit on the theme that I've said often and I won't repeat it because my listeners have heard it but it was like AI is going to add jobs but t today I was I was reading because AI to me and I've said it before too sounds a lot like the printing press meaning like if you look at Rome fell 
and right the the western world from the had a thousand years from the fifth century to the 15th century of like um the medieval times right they call it the dark ages right there were on the other side of the world like in the islamic world that was the golden age of islam and you had two mindsets islam was opening up their mind to all kinds of new philosophies they were trans translating knowledge into arabic gaining understanding becoming more open they didn't have a lot of debt all the debt that the western world had so it was two dichotomies in in the in the that thousand years the western world was closing their mind creating all these draconian rules building hierarchies and kingdoms and or aristocracies and it wasn't until you know double book entry uh accounting happened that they kind of got from the islamic world and then the printing press like was invented right and that kind of that kind of took us out of the recession because you had centralized decision makings and, and like what you're saying the the church that was the government at the time for the in partner mm -hmm. with the kingdoms but you know they were tied together they were afraid that the printing press would mess up the economics that they set but it actually like like created more equity right distributed the, you, you didn't have all the wealth in the kings and the lords right because at that time they owned dang near all the land you know what i'm yep, saying yep. It, it distributed it and so i'm I, I you hit on the nail I, i'm like no ai is gonna like distribute it now we all have our own free will to like go with the flow at our own pace right so you can choose to continue to be a peasant you know what i'm saying operate, <laughs> operate in the system or or you can um get you a book because you can read the printing press now you know what i'm saying like you, <laughs> It's, it's almost like um, it, the a good analogy is the application of the influence, right? I was going to say power, but some people have connotation around it. Let's just like call it influence, right? In the dark age, you know, media like uh, dichotomy, the application of that influence was extremely direct, but required extremely like strong and overarching control. So you imagine if humanity is a giant boat, in the dark ages, they had the application where someone could, like a hand could take the boat and turn it, right? The printing press comes, the information age, Renaissance kicks off, and now it changes that control point from needing a hand to move the boat to turning the tiny wheel on top and the rudder kicks over and then the boat still makes the same exact turn, right? Smaller, much more specific application of influence, but bigger ripple effects across. And like AI is kind of basically repeating that also where all the information gets democratized. And so some tiny person is going to take that and apply it in a way that's going to have massive ripple effects, as opposed to needing to build a Warren Buffett style company to move a market. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's real. So, so, so going back, going back to money making, mm -hmm. what I hear, what I hear you saying, and, and I'm, I'm in agreement, there's going to be infinite ways to make money as the infrastructure gets built. Right. But like when the printing press was invented, like we didn't we we had no idea you can build a standard oil yes right? yes, you know, yes. With, the, with with the ability to shrink the time frame it it it, it, it requires you to learn how to create a excellent refining process mm -hmm. so going back to the, the question of how do you make money um i look for an opportunity in operations right so can you take a very known process and do it more efficiently and that works really well when you're a new entrant to the market, right? So let's say that you are, uh, you got a fleet of AI trucks, you want to, you know, a trucking business and you want to start moving stuff about back and forth across country. You need maybe three or four people, somebody to manage the AI trucks, somebody to win the business and somebody to operate the accounts. Before that's a, that's a company of like 15, 20 people. So I wouldn't say that the company of 15, 20 people should get rid of 15, 20 people and start using AI. But a new market to the new market entry could start there and then create a company that maybe grows to 30 people but has way more trucks and infrastructure because now there are new entrants to the market that can leverage the AI in a less destructive way. Um, the other part is finding the entrants that are starting those things and investing into them because of the fact that you see where they're going, like you understand that vision, right? And that becomes more a portfolio strategy of let me find people that are arbitraging this new technology against the incumbents to be able to slice out their part of the market because market 
pie sizing is going to change dramatically, right? Like we're going to go from like, you know, three big players to 25 players to like 50 players. And then once all that, you know, disruption and bifurcation happens inside of those things, then you're going to start seeing conglomeration and people, and that, that's the, just the cycle, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, everything consolidates into a few, breaks back down to small ones, consolidates again. Sometimes it's like a standard oil where the government has to say, literally, you need to break up or like, a, you know, the bell, Southwestern Bell had to be broken up to four. But that's usually typically extreme cases. Usually the market does it for you. And so if you're an investor, you can just balance your portfolio against that. Like, you know, if you have three blue chips, you know, maybe you want a whole bunch of other smaller ones that are going to do that disruption. And then you don't have to be so tied specifically to like which one is the actual pick. Right. Because right. now you're a market participant, not just like a market guesser. Got it. So so you're ba so you're 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 basically saying th these are so like let's say th these are pillars of of eco these are pillars of industries that we humans always organize around, right? Right. And so like you know, I'll, I'll pick one: auto industry. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so these are the these are the kings and lords, right? Now let me go let me go bet on the multiple small incumbents, right? Mm -hmm. and kind of watch, basically, let me go to America, invest some money with the democracy and kind of like let that right, play, right. let that arbitrage play out. And then if you're let's say we make it specific to the new economy, let's call it AI a new economy, then you start looking for like what's foundational like what's uh, support maintenance and utilization, and then like what's the cherry on top, which is usually uh, application. So like NVIDIA is a company that is foundational. They build the actual chips that people train artificial intelligence on, and they sell those to data centers that are actually running the infrastructure that most people build artificial intelligence applications on. So in that case, NVIDIA and Microsoft and Google, um, I'm trying to think who else runs it's an Amazon AWS. Those are like your foundational co companies. Other people that make that process of utilizing the new technology easier and faster. That's your support and maintenance stuff, mm -hmm. right? So you can put all your money into Nvidia and you'll probably be, let I me, mean, you'll be, that's like the best thing IBM like 60 years ago. You're probably going to be good for a very long time. Yeah. But it might, I mean, it's really expensive right now because everybody realizes that and it might take a little bit longer to grow. It's not too long get gains. It's just, you know, might be more, uh, might be a longer curve. And then you got these middle market entrants that um, are doing that support care and feeding in the middle, and they probably have higher uptake and they're faster and are slightly cheaper. And they're going to be a mix of like well-funded startups and spin out companies from like professional consulting. Like I, I saw one that's uh, cybersecurity for, and monitoring for AI the other day. They're a brand new startup, but really they come out of a bigger company. So they're technically like a mature spin out, mm -hmm. right? But they're still a solid investment in that middle space because they're doing care and feeding and securing. And then you have people that I would call like the tip of the spear. And these are guys that like make a new vector database or they create a different way of talking between these large language models and connecting it to like your dashboards, that kind of stuff. Those are application layers. And right now, because everything in the AI space builds on the last 25 years, they're somewhat thin as far as like their uh, defensibility and margin, like it's going to be frothy at the top because you might have 15 people that all build AI dashboards. You kind of really can't know which one of those are going to win. Right, right. right. So then you have to go into more of like, all right, you know, what's their, what's their management like? What's the connection between them and other market entries? Are they supported by an open AI or something like that? Like you got to start looking at other more social graph kind of things to see like, is this a good investment? Do they have staying power inside of these? Like, you know, as this market will change, will they be the ones to buy up the other guys? Um, but yeah, it's like, if you want super safe, foundational if you want like somewhat risky but like mid you go for like the care and feeding and maintenance stuff and then if you just want to be like in the headlines with like the super sexy things that are super risky application layer yeah no it makes sense and so let, let's go to the application letter layer from from your experience if you do try if you do decide to go that route right my my instinct tells me and i want you to kind of shape this mm -hmm. based on your experience it tells me that <clears throat> In that app, in that instant, it requires focus. So for me, it would, it would say if I were to have an investment in that space, I would go super narrow, super niche, and I would like know everything I can about the 15 players, kind of like what you're saying, and like go very deep and then try to try to pick the ones that got 
the edge that I've discovered from going very deep and then wait for the market to know what I know. I mean, is that, is that sort of how, how you might approach yeah. it? Yes. And, and I feel like depending on what kind of investor you are, right? If you're an investor that also operates their own business, you can almost think of it as would I use this, right? And, and similarly, because I've heard, you know, general investment advice, they're like, you should buy and own the companies that you use every day, right? So like, if you're buying something from Unilever, you might want some Unilever stock because you're contributing to that stock in the first place. It does kind of work that way for like business. If you're a business owner and you're like, I use this, you know, one AI tool to do all of my spreadsheets. They might not be investable today. Maybe they're like a very small, like seed level startup. But if they do get to a place where they become investable, it's probably good to keep an eye on them because you are already contributing to the, their success. And especially if they're a startup, you are very heavily contributing. Every single customer in a startup is extremely valuable. So that becomes a situation where you're like, you can almost like write the story because you're investing in the thing that you're using in two ways, as an investor and as a customer. And so if you find yourself with deep subject matter knowledge of a specific application of AI, you're already a step ahead on investing in it because you're using it every day. Like it. You know the pain points of problems. So you can almost say, you can see very instantly in someone's pitch, oh, you're addressing my pain point or you're not addressing my pain point. You know, is it on your roadmap? If it's not on the roadmap, then it, they may not totally understand, which could speak more to their management team versus like you as a customer picking the right company. And, and then for you, how, how easy how easy is it to, I want to ask it a different way in a, in a non-technical way. Cause you and I both are in agreement on finding teams that balance head with heart. Mm -hmm. right? That's a, is that a factor in what you look at as well? Right. When you look at it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the, the thing that I've experienced as a technologist is that there are millions, uh, I'm not, I don't think there's, there's a million of brilliant technologists that can build amazing software. And a lot of those engineers are spread out all over the globe. Most people don't hear about them because they are so deep into building and figuring out what is right, that they are not responding to what is useful. So it's, it's not a good way. It's, it's not a, it's not fair to say that the person who explains it best typically also has an understanding of like how it actually be useful to you. But that's a good way of like, segmenting out certain things. So from an investment perspective, a lot of companies may have better tech, but they may not win in the market because they don't do a good job of explaining their value proposition to customers or to investors. Right. And so, yes, it's good to find the best technology, but like at this place where everyone's kind of using exactly the same thing, it's probably best to find the ones that look like they are able to educate their customers and get to their customers in the best way. And that's, that's from picking, like if I was to pick a company, like I was make a basket of companies, I'd look for ones that have, and I wouldn't say solid marketing, actually, it's more solid thought leadership. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's almost a, like, you have to do this as a startup nowadays, you need to be out having conversations with people in a visible space so people can understand how you think. And so if their CEOs, their, you know, low leadership in the middle are having those conversations, you can find them and like get a sense of what they're they're, they're saying and like how they're thinking about it, it gives you a sense of like where the company could be going. Um, that does take some work, right? I think that is like, if there is a AI system anywhere that is going to create a lot of explosion in the market, it's gonna be a research platform that allows you to plug in a company and find all of that in one place and do like a breakdown. Like, oh, let me review this company. Let me find everything that these people have talked about and figure out like, does it line up, right? If you can do that quickly, you can start reviewing things all a much faster clip than someone who's got to go and Google all of that. Yeah, no, for I, I call what you just said like my Jay Z rule. Like I, I need to find the song because I always reference it. I don't remember the song and I can't remember the specific words. But Jay Jay said something like, like on because you know if you if you study Jay Z, you know Jay Z is a genius. Mm -hmm. I mean like like a literal genius. And so you he says, he said so. He said honestly, I really want to rap like Talib Kweli or one of those deep thought linkers. He said. He, and I, this part I mess up, but he says that's not what sell records. So Jay was like a perfect balance, you know what I'm saying? Like he was a mm -hmm. genius, where you knew he can he can be in the booth with the best and not get embarrassed. But he also wasn't so deep into nerdum where he wasn't like passing up the money, right? And that's like right, that's like, finding that midpoint, right? That's the answer if you want to make money. And so like from an investment standpoint, like I think about that's what Coinbase, 
right? Reason why I own some of that is Brian Armstrong can hang out with the best technologists, but he also is like, say, man, you know, like some technologists would be like, I don't want to sell out. It's not about selling out. It's about like, like, it's, a, it's you know, you got to balance reaching regular folks that are not going to like completely become cyberpunks and go off the grid. <laughs> you know and, what I mean? And it's, you know, to the point of like realizing your own goal, right? I think a lot of people get pulled in certain directions because of like what the rest of the swell is, as opposed to thinking about like, what is my personal investment and stake in this you know, position, concept, technology, whatever it is. Um, I, a good example is, uh, you know, during the GameStop meme craze, there's a lot of people who on a personal goal level should have sold a lot earlier because they had realized their goal. Like if they had specific needs in life and like maybe they tossed in, you know, a significant part of savings or like life savings or whatever, like they needed to 10X an investment. And like that was the one moment in the time that you could probably do that for no reason whatsoever, aside from that everyone believed in it. And so they got very, very sucked into the idea of being people that held and were anti-market, which is a different goal than realizing a financial event. So they 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 were they had their emotional intelligence subverted. Hmm. And it and it wasn't like an intentional, like you can't say there was one person that subverted it. It was a collective consciousness where everyone came together and adopted a goal that had nothing to do with anyone else's personal gain. Yeah. Mob so, intelligence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's some people that still were able to survive that and like make it out, right? But that now now you're introducing chaos and chance into the mix as opposed to like saying, hey. I know what's good for me and I know what's good for the people around me. And that's what I'm going to stick to as opposed to, well, everybody else is doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and that's actually one of the hardest things in investing because that's one of the things specifically in Bitcoin, because I'm, I'm so passionate about finance and I understand the old financial system and it's weak points that are expanding. And I understand the financial system that, that we dreamed of from understanding the weak point which manifested as bitcoin and i go like this is exactly like if you understand this system this is exactly what you would dream of and so but i have to check myself from not becoming um uh, i don't too much of a believer is the wrong word but you know what i mean like too too enamored with the beliefs and, and the, the the possibilities and the concepts as opposed to like the actual yeah, right. Like, just let me not fall asleep in the dream. Like, be like, hey, this is better than previous, but let me mm -hmm. let me stay awake and let the dream expand so that when the bubble burst, I don't, which is probably not going to happen for a generation, but I'm just saying, you know, I don't want to fall in love with my own creation. That's what I call it. Don't fall in love with my own creation or I end up like the people who don't believe it right now because they fell in love with their own creation. And that's, yeah. a, that, that's a delicate, you know what I'm saying? That's a not an easy mm -hmm. thing. And, and then there's also the um, if if you can get that part right the, the the emotional balance component and like the conceptual balance between like what's possible in the dream and like what's actually going on you can see when trends change um, and and we see this in in regular markets right like a good example of that is Silicon Valley Bank and the the mid market banking collapse that happened they were all calibrated for a zero interest rate environment and. I don't think it would have been crazy to say that we kind of all saw interest rates were going to rise at some point over 24 months. And so the fact that they were that out of step really was they got stuck in this idea that somehow nothing was going to change because it had never changed before. Right. And like every single disclaimer says, <laughs> current, <laughs> uh, current, what, current uh, results are not indicative of future, like, yeah, like current trends are not indicative of future results. That's a disclaimer that every single financial professional and institution has to use. And somehow this institution did not listen to that very basic principle. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that they could have moved faster or something, but like, you know, a less disruptive wind down of that bank would have been saying, hey, we see this position might be tenuous over 24 months. And so we're going to say, let's start hedging maybe 25% of our, you know, stuff somewhere. Like there's some kind of risk equation that was miscalibrated where 90 to 80% of their assets were in this very, very not performant, um, brittle, like zero interest world. And they weren't ready for any kind of change. Yeah. Yeah. Nerd math. My term for that is nerd math. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, nerd, nerd. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, and also being able to emotionally accept the possibility that it could so not that you're you know that you have to accept that you're wrong, but that it could be the opposite, mm -hmm. right? And so when it happens or when it starts moving in that direction, you're like, I have, I've already accepted the idea that it could happen. So when I see it happening, I don't just bury my head in the sand because I don't want to believe that the thing it's changing. Yeah. It, yeah. And you, and you said, cause you said it earlier, humans, we're not really rational. We like to think that we're rational, but I feel like you always have to have the possibility of us, our moods changing. And when our mood changes, there's no rational, like you can't, like if, if you dealt with somebody who's in a bad mood, there's nothing rationally that you can say when the mood changes. You just got to let the mood play out. Right. You know it saying? just is. It just is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the market, the mar markets have moods, right? Technology, all technology has moods. Like they're all expressions of humans, right? So even though, and, and I love the Bitcoin as example, Bitcoin is based on like very, very set, solid math, right? The entire time that Bitcoin is existent, there have been people who, based on their mood, have wanted to change the math. Like, that's actually what makes it kind of like amazing is that it's been resilient to those mood swings because it created a non emotional mechanism to affect that change. And no one has been able to overcome that, like, you know, mathematical principle based on their current mood, right? No one's been able to get 51% of the network to change what the truth is or to even introduce like new code into it to change the behavior because no matter what their mood was they had to get everybody else on the same page and that consensus building is extremely hard when it expands where the threshold expands with the size of the market mm -hmm. right because you because you see that almost with demagogues right they they have a constrained amount of of, of market and then they grab us a, a share of it because the market won't expand faster than they can grab up people and convert them to their idea but the mathematical component of Bitcoin means that by being able to get more power in the market, you've now expanded the market, which increases the threshold of what you have to get to then change the market to your own benefit. Yeah, and so yeah. you're basically continually chasing that over and over again, and it tires out most bad actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it motivates others to create like, and, and I'm not meaning this in a knot, like a Solana or a Doge, because the barrier to entry to create your new blockchain is, so easy because like because i mean i think there's going to be other currencies that are mm -hmm. going to work but is you know bitcoin set up to where if you want to go explore that it's just way easier for you to like take all that money you would use to disrupt bitcoin go create a new one right i mean even including marketing and creating new believers like that's just way easier to create a new religion right and then find new believers and then yep. test out what works you know what i'm saying something's going to work eventually but the bitcoin which is which is also an, an entrepreneurial principle, right? You get a lot of people that say, I don't like how, uh, I don't name any company. Let's call JP Morgan Chase. I don't like how JP Morgan Chase is managing their money, right? I don't, I want JP Morgan Chase to change. Which one is easier? Starting your own fund or trying to change everything about JP Morgan Chase? Yeah, you're not chasing, you're not changing JP Morgan Chase. Yeah. Not. And that doesn't mean someone won't, right? Like it, because of the way it's set up, it's a it's a con collection of people. There will be someone that will rise to management that have completely different ideas than Jamie Dimon, and they will change how yeah. Chase does business, right? Yeah. But right now, we don't know who that person is. And so if you're not content to just exist and continue to climb to the top, and if your goal is not to become Jamie Dimon, then it's probably better use of your time to start a new fund. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. And that, like one of the, and we talked about this before. One of the most impressive things about Jamie, about Jamie Dimon, J.P. Morgan, because uh, I feel like J.P. Morgan is a reincarnation of J.P. Morgan. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I did a podcast today on the first billionaire, a first billion dollar company, and it's one of my favorite stories in Think and Grow Rich, where you know J.P. Morgan had been chasing down uh, Andrew Carnegie for like probably decades, and he finally was like. All right, man, I'll sell it to you, right? And he threw out this number, you know, six hundred million dollars or whatever, and he cool right. bet, bought him out, combined it with his other conglomerates, and made U.S. Steel and became a billion dollar company. But I was like, I was like, man, him, you know, it, it you know, him and Jamie Dimon are like a hundred years from now, you're gonna have J.P. Morgan, and you're gonna have another, you know, reincarnation of. I mean, I think I think J.P. Morgan is gonna be one of those companies that continue to like evolve throughout time, right? An American class. Yeah. Like a Louis Vuitton or a, you know, uh, what, what do you call that? Uh, the, the one, I, the, the insurance company, Lloyd to London. Um, yeah, yeah. 
been around since basically you know the inventing of accounting and ships like yeah. yeah yeah because because they and and really you know in a way you could say that the reason that jp morgan will stay around like that is because their business is the concept of the belief in money which is a very serious abstraction like it's you know they do real business like they're a bank right but they're so tied in to such a fundamental human element right now, which is the belief that specifically money is important and is needed for everything, that that's their core business. It's not banking specifically or lending or investment banking or, you know, invest it's, it's all of it because their business is the concept of money. So what will happen is the concept of money will change and they will still have all the foundational tools to continue to operate that business, no matter what they actually are using as the medium. They are painters. They can paint on any campus. Yeah, no nah, man, I, I love that man. I love that. We we definitely gotta keep these going because, you know, as as we found out when we had coffee, we we probably can go for 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 hours. And so this is why I wanted to have the conversation because I feel like I, I feel like a for the community they would love to see, you know, this banter specifically you, I think. And I'm not just saying it's like your 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 mind and your ability to understand the technical details of all of this but then communicate with us mere mortals, you know, how it works uh, is, is amazing. So I appreciate you taking time out to, to share. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it was fun. But... Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, are you open to people reaching out to you on any platform if they just want to follow you and get your thoughts? Yeah. Primarily the best platform to reach me is uh, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm kind of semi-active there. Uh, I'm trying to do a little bit more of like collecting my thoughts and like putting them out in some kind of structured way. Um, but yeah, typically LinkedIn is the best way. All right, so, sounds good. Then I'll, I'll tag I'll tag your tag your LinkedIn in the post so they can have it. And uh, yeah, man, we'll do this again. Appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you for having me.